what chore do you hate doing? Laundry. Okay. I agree with all of those. I hate them all. <laughs> Any chore. Um, if you haven't been with us, uh, for the last several weeks, we started a year-long series called The Hero Challenge. And our hopes in what is taking place is that we are recognizing that God has given us this one life. There's not a do-over. This, this is our shot at being able to live out everything that he desires, the way that he crafted us, our DNA, the very fiber of our being, to be able to live out the best possible life that he came to secure for us. And so we've been talking about the fact that sometimes we see our spiritual life as a compartment rather than, as God sees it, our entire life. And so we've been looking at every area, physical, recreational, what we would term spiritual, our prayer life and getting inside of the Word of God, all of it. And we've basically been taking a look at it and really kind of asking ourselves how, how can we begin to restructure and reshape so that we can live out the very quality and the very purpose and the very intent with what God gave us in this life. And so there's been a lot of talk of intentionality. There's been a lot of talk of attention. And for the last couple of weeks, we've been asking a question that is sort of a haunting question or could be, um, which is this one right here. Am I taking responsibility for my life? And it's real important, this last word, really, like, really. Right, let's try that again. Am I taking responsibility for my life, really? And so what we've done is we've, uh, just to give you a little review, we recognize that we were created by God, and we see even before sin entered the world, when God created Adam and Eve, he created them and gave them responsibility. And we said that that's, that's in our DNA. We were created to manage and to be able to carry responsibility. And second, we said that we're the happiest when we're being responsible. Moms, when they're nurturing and taking care of their children and doing those things and, and taking care of the responsibility, cleaning up poopy diapers, making the meals for their husband. I'm just kidding. That was a little far. I went a little far. But when they're nurturing their children and giving themselves to them, they feel they're happiest. And men, if you've, if you've ever been at a place where you were, or any of us, that were without jobs, and we start to, it starts to kind of rub against us and, and it, it we feel a little bit out of, out of whack and we start to feel less about ourselves. And then when we're starting to take ownership of our responsibilities in our lives, we start to feel happiest. And then we also said that when we choose to be irresponsible, that when we act in an irresponsible way, we start to create conflict in ourselves. And we said that our irresponsibility eventually becomes somebody else's responsibility. And so we can't just say it. It just, it, it's, it's all about me. I'm a, I'm a lone wolf here. I'm the lone ranger. You know, what decisions I decide to not be responsible for will, in effect, cause someone else to have to clean up my mess. And then last week, we talked about a principle that uh, is, is not necessarily, we, we sort of uh, correlated it to um, Archimedes' principle of buoyancy and gravity and You'd have, to, you'd have to go back and hear that uh, for me to want to explain all of that to you. But we said there are principles that exist that God's given us as a gift. And that principle that we talked about last week was a principle of sowing and reaping. That eventually everyone reaps what they sow and they reap later and they reap greater. And so we talked about leveraging that principle. And we always want to approach the word of God with the heart and the view of the vision that God's giving us because he's always leading us to the best possible life. Now, if you're like me, you, were pro you probably grew up maybe in a Christian home and that was the furthest thing from your mind. <laughs> you did not think that this was the best possible life. Maybe you're, you got thumped a little bit with the Bible, Bible thumping. Anybody been Bible thumped? I have. And, uh, and so your idea was that you just didn't want to make God mad at you because he was up in heaven with a lightning bolt. But there is so much more contained in this book. How many of you know that? That speak of and resonate God's goodness, his grace, his mercy, all that he's accomplished for us through his son Christ Jesus. There is so much contained in the death, burial, and resurrection. And we choose here at E3 Church to be a people that are going to extract the best possible life from these pages. Can I get an oh yeah? 
So when we look at the principle of sowing and reaping, we recognize that we, this is not something that we're, God is up in heaven saying, bless that person, bless that person, you know, curse, curse, bless, curse, curse, just like boats that float or rocks that sink. He's not up there going float, 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 sink, sink, sink. You got a little bit of the Archimedes principle. Anyway, so we know that he's created these things for us. And so we want to be people who would leverage that principle and begin to take responsibility. Now this morning, uh, I'm going to talk to three groups that I want to address. The first is those that are irreligious and who mask irresponsibility with prayer. Okay, so you may have no idea what I just said. That's okay, I'll explain it. Um, I grew up in, in a, an environment and in a church where, where there was a lot of people that were praying for revival. Okay, so a lot of people that prayed for revival. I'm sure you've, you've been there. And, and specifically, they would, they would pray for the nations to be reached. And there was a lot of, of that going on, but there was a whole little of anybody actually doing anything to go out to those places. So in fact, I would hear conversations and people would tell me at one point I decided to give my life. I was uh, 19 years old. I was in a church and I came up to the front and I, I just decided, I mean, I've been praying for a long time. God, give me a passion for people because I, for some reason, don't like them. And I see this in your word. But could you help me? Because I don't, I don't really like them and I don't care what's happening to them. And, uh, and so I began to pray that and my heart began to stir. And then all of a sudden he opened up a door. And my first trip, of course, uh, as a kid who grew up in uh, just just south of Santa Barbara, California, in kind of a golf course environment as I went to the, the, uh, just the, the utmost parts of India in those places. It was great for me. Opened up my eyes. But I came back and I recognized that, you know what? Sometimes people mask their irresponsibility by praying for things and never making a move to be responsible to go do something. So we're going to be talking to those people because it's not about covering a nation in prayer. It's about covering a nation with people preaching the good news of God's love and God's goodness as well as in a local city as people begin to reach out and love their neighbors. All right, are you with me? All right, so if you're offended by that, I'm sorry, you might be stepping on your toes. Uh, the second are those that have misguided compassion. So this is someone who, uh, who acts, you know, we see someone who acts irresponsible, and instead of holding those people accountable, we sort of go, ah, uh, you know, they just, you know, they're just, you know, just got a lot of stuff, you know, in their life, and stuff is happening. And so all we do is we, we begin to enable them, and we begin to create reasons why it's okay for them to be irresponsible. And so going back, we recognize, remember what we said about irresponsibility, that eventually it leads to somebody else cleaning up your mess. And you all enjoy the fact that I tell my children when they leave their towels on the floor, come on in here. Now ask me, if you ask me to pick up your towel and put it in the, in the hamper for you, go ahead and do that. All right, you three-year-old. No, I'm just kidding. Or my, six, my seven-year-old is better. He's like, no, Dad, I'm not going to do that. But essentially, that's what you're asking me to do, son, and blah, blah, blah. Third group is the group who feels like they have been sowing all the right seeds, doing all the right things, but since they're connected to irresponsible people, they, they, they sort of get in the windfall of, of, of some things that aren't so great. Maybe you know what I'm talking about, and you just think that that just isn't, isn't fair. So I'm going to address all three, three of those groups today, and we're going to look at a passage in Joshua 7, and we're going to get a little bit of context for the story that we're going to see. But Joshua is a story of a military leader. He's the leader of Israel, and he is leading the Israelites across the Jordan to the promised land, to Canaan. And at this point in the story, Moses is dead. And some of you, you know the story, you know, and I don't, I don't want to sing the, the childhood songs, but, you know, Moses sort of wandered in the desert for a long time. And uh, so now Joshua takes over. He's the military leader. And um, this story is a little bit difficult because of what's taking shape here. Because essentially Joshua is leading two to three million people into a place, into the promised land, to essentially remove some people who have been there for a long time. And so uh, we, we kind of have to understand the full sort of story because basically they're going there to run these people off. And so some of us, you know, we, we don't, 
uh, you know, we don't want God to be this way, I think, or, or we're just a little bit like taken back by the story. And in fact, when you read the totality of the story, if you, if you don't filter it through the New Testament, you could get a little scared. Okay, let me, let me move on. So 640 years before this is taking place, God had said to Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation. He had a son. His son had sons. They had some more sons. Multiplication took effect. And he also told Abraham that he was going to raise up a nation on another piece of real estate. And he said to him, not, not in this place, but in another place. And many of us who know the story in the Old Testament, the Israelites became a nation, but they became a, a nation where? In Egypt. So they became a slave nation. And through Moses, they leave Egypt, they exodus there, and Joshua is essentially bringing them back home, right? So when they left, there was about 45 people. And something in the water, because multiplication has taken place, and now there is two to three million people that are going, all right? Now, let's read Genesis 15, 16 first, just so we get a little bit of understanding. It says, in the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. So, if you want to be historical, you want to do a little bit of digging. The Amorites were an interesting group of people. They did some, some pretty heinous things. By today's standards, it would be very heinous. They sacrificed children. Uh, the way that they treated each other, especially women, it was pretty rough. And so, here God is leading the people into Canaan, and we, we know that their first stop was Jericho. Any remember, anybody know the story of Jericho? Yes. Walls came, they came tumbling down, that's right. Why don't you sing the song to your neighbor? Anyways, so they go through Jericho, and this, this sort of military conquest is pretty easy, and, and in fact, the way that it's orchestrated, God is essentially telling the Israelites, you know, depend on me. You know, walk around Walk around, you know, have some people out front blowing some trumpets, and do it, do it a few times, and the walls come tumbling down. So it happens. These guys are feeling pretty good about it. I mean, they got to be thinking this is awesome, you know. So they're on to their, their next sort of city in, in progression into uh, the promised land. And so the next city that they're about to confront is Ai. Ai! All right, everyone say Ai! All right, Ai. And God gives them some specific instructions to take this city. And he tells them, if you know your Old Testament, if not, it's a great story and you should. Um, and so he tells them something specifically not to do. He tells them when they go into Ai and they, and they besiege it, he says, don't take any of the gold or the silver. It's coming back to anybody right now? Okay, so don't, don't take any of the gold or the silver. Essentially, uh, what, what he was telling them, because it's kind of difficult. I mean, especially if you're a warrior, you got you to gotta admit, you know, if you go in and you whoop some tail, you know, and you see some gold and some silver around, it's probably a little tempting. But God sets them straight up front and says, don't take the gold or the silver. Leave it as an offering for me. I want you to recognize that I'm, I'm giving this place to you. So leave it as an offering. And so for those of you who are not aware one genius in the bunch who decides to, to disobey that order, he, he takes the gold and the silver and he hides it under his tent. And his name is Achan. One person knew that it was Achan. That's all right. But uh, there's a reason why his name was Achan, because we'll find out later that he was seriously Achan. So here we go. Joshua 7, 2 through 5, and I'm reading out of uh, the TNIV. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near Beth-Avon. I'm going to do that every time, so just don't worry about it. To the east of Bethel, and he told them, I mean, essentially, that's, you know, I mean, basically, it's like, you know, Scottsdale 101, right on the corner of Mayo and 101 is what's going on here, okay, for those of you. If he, this was during those times, everybody would know. Oh, yeah, right there in that spot. So, go up, spy out the region. So, the men went up, they spied out Ai, when they returned to Joshua, they said, Not all the army will have to go up against Ai. Send two or three thousand men to take it. Do not weary the whole army, for only a few people live there. So about three thousand went up, but they were routed by the men of Ai, who killed about thirty-six of them. They chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as the stone quarries and struck them down on the slopes. At this, the hearts of the people melted in fear, and they became like water." 
Then Joshua, he tore his clothes, he fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord, remaining there till evening. The elders of Israel did the same. They sprinkled dust on their heads, and Joshua said, Ah, oh, sovereign Lord, why did you ever bring this people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us if only we had been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan? Pardon your servant, Lord. What can I say now that Israel's been routed by its enemies? Like, God, hello. The Canaanites and other people of the country will hear about this, and they'll surround us and wipe out your name from the earth. What then will you do for your own great name? I mean, this, Joshua's pretty much laying it on to the Lord, isn't he? Like, what are you going to do about this, God? You've made us look like idiots here. And um, the Lord said, you're right, Joshua. I'm sorry about that, bro. I did My bad. I forgot to be there for you. No, he says, the Lord said to Joshua, dude, stand up, bro. What are you doing on your face? Israel has sinned. Now they violated my co covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They've taken some of the devoted things. They've stolen. They've lied. They've put them with their own possession. That is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They turn their backs. They run because they've been made liable to destruction. I'll not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. So, I mean, here, here it is. You know, this is, this is the gold and the silver. Is, is the, uh, it's the offering to the Lord. It's, it's devotion to him. And Joshua's first take, obviously, which is like a lot of us, is um, he, he, he takes, you know, a stance of, oh my God, you know, I'm not, how can we, we this isn't our fault. We're not the ones that, that could have done anything. I mean, Israel sinned? Missed, Israel missed the mark? We missed the mark or whatnot? And, and so he, Joshua does what? He gets down on his knees and he prays. He, he prays and God delivers him a verbal butt whooping, right? And, and he tells him, dude, your praying isn't going to make any difference because the responsibility for what's going on is taking place in your hometown. So quit praying and get yourself in line. And as a result of that, you'll begin to experience the blessing of the victory in the battle. Now, this whole thing is a glimpse for us. Now, I want to filter this in context of the New Testament and through the finished work of the cross, but I want us to remember what we talked about last week as well, because this is a glimpse of what happens in a community, what happens in a family, what happens in a nation, when somebody acts irresponsible, the rest of us are cleaning up the mess. I'm not on any soapbox politically, I'm just telling us, Biblically, what happens when somebody acts irresponsible, we see that everybody, in a sense, is affected by it. So one person acts out, and the whole community gets impacted. Now, is this fair? No, it's not fair, but it's still true. It's still true. And if what we sow, we reap, if I'm connected to you, and if we're connected in our community, we can obviously take this and look at this in a very negative light, in, in a fear, but I don't want to do that this morning. I want to take this and look at it from the vision aspect, and I want to take, and I want to look at it for the cities and the jobs and the family and the community where God placed you. And, and with the responsibility that he's given to us to love, right? To separate church and hate. I brought it back. Yes, I did, okay? To separate where we would become a people who are no known for being against things and people who, who hold up signs against stuff. Ladies and gentlemen, in my opinion, that is irresponsibility because responsibility is the grace and the mercy and the example of what Jesus showed us when he took the woman caught in the act of adultery and his responsibility for the love of God was to lift her up and to send her on her way and to give her responsibility to not miss the mark anymore, but he showered down his grace and his love, yes. right? Yes. And we have a responsibility to the city, 
that God, we could sit up here all day long and sing, you're the God of this city. You're the, I don't know the rest of the song now, and I should know that because we sing it here. But just singing that song and just praying a prayer is not going to affect the community that God has called us to. Hello? And irresponsibility is just as much part of that and not owning the fact that God calls us to love others. He calls us to restore and redeem and to bring hope and to encourage. So while this story could get a little bit scary for us, I want to see it in light of redemption. I mean, because I have made some decisions, and so have you, that I could tell you have affected others. <laughs> Anybody else? Bad and poor decisions that I have made that essentially have brought everybody else into the mix. I've made them when I was younger. I've made them this past week. <laughs> and that's what happens in community. But I've also made good decisions. I've made decisions that have, have been part of the responsibility that God's given them. I've, I've answered the call when God says, Brad, I want you to do this, even though I consulted with what I had in the tank, my ability, my, uh, you know, uh, eight well ableness to do something, and stepped out anyway, and have seen the fruit of what God produces in taking responsibility. And that's where, where I want us to get to. What I want us to get to is to become a people who are not just praying for our city alone. Is prayer good? Yes, but what does prayer do? It affects you. It stirs your heart. But until we accept the responsibility to love our neighbors as ourself and to be able to see them through the eyes that God sees them, and until we can get to the fact that our responsibility is to love the broken and the disenfranchised, the hurt, and to hear their stories, and to offer hope, and quit judging first, and, and, and holding up our flags and whatever else we do, and becoming not people who buy chicken, but become people who love the face of the city in which we're called. You can buy chicken. I'm just saying that. I hate to be a harper, but it kind of has frustrated me just a little bit that this is what we do. We respond to buying chicken at restaurants only. Guys, we got to become better. I mean, we got to become more known for that. I'm not saying if, we spend, if you spend some money on some chicken at a restaurant, that's not great. I, I get it. I get it. I get it. But let's aim for a higher goal because divisiveness and, and, and creating a chasm instead of loving people, instead of going out and reaching out and making that become known. Amen? Yeah. You can talk to me after if you don't like that. So, um. So we, we have got to recognize how this impacts each of us and then our responsibility to each other, accountability. That accountability isn't, that we're not, I'm not offering up the spiritual police here. I'm offering up where we would look at each other and love and help one another because the way that you love your wife or don't love your wife has impact on everything. The way that you manage your finances has an impact not just on you, but on other things. Our irresponsibility essentially will affect others. Has anybody ever seen that? Yes. I mean, it's easy to see that one, but the way that we live, whether we love or we judge, will impact and affect and we have a responsibility to each other, and I want you to hear what I'm saying because I am not authorizing a bunch of religious Bible thumping, but I am authorizing a group of people who will love people radically because true spiritual growth, you are able to handle people's mistakes and flaws the same way that Jesus did because the same compassion and the same love that runs through your heart that's told to us in Romans 5.5, 5, the same love has been shed abroad in your hearts by the Holy Spirit, has given you the power to reach out and to love the hurting and the broken the same way. And I am here to authorize that. Yes. The other, no thank you. It's, we've been there, we've done that, gotten the t-shirt, we're not making any strategic movements in the area of judgment. <laughs> but radical loving of people 
seeing each other and helping to encourage when we're missing the mark in an area because we care about one another, because we see the totality of the principle that takes effect, that Aiken effect, right? The Aiken effect is something that is, is real. And when you come into a community of people like a church, which I love about this community, that we are authentic and open but remember, too, that we give insight, and it's what a community of faith is to look like, where we encourage and we help one another to live and to love the same way, to manage and to be responsible, to encourage and to gift, to mentor and to supply, so that we can grow, so that we can essentially affect change and transformation within our jobs, within our community, within our families, and let the Aiken effect move in the positive. Are you with me this morning? Am I making any sense? Thank God. Thank you, Lord, for that. And so, you know, I, it's, it's funny because um, sometimes I have a, a, a poor habit of staying up late, and, and I, I, like, I like a lot of shows. I mean, don't, don't, don't judge me, okay? But I cannot stop watching Storage Wars. Uh, <laughs> auction kings, and I don't know what's going on with me. They just keep running those episodes, and I just, I just stay there. And from time to time, I watch Intervention. Anybody seen this show? And I, and I think about Intervention, and, I, and I, in light of all of this and how tough it is, you know, whether you've ever had a loved one and had to participate, I have, and you've had to participate in a very difficult confrontation, Sometimes we become people that we think, remember what I talked about those three people? We, we think, you know, we'll just, we love people, we love them, we love them, and, and yet we, we miss out on that confrontation is a real part of loving someone. I did not say being the spiritual police and going around and doing that, because we've done that, but I'm talking about really loving each other to confront when we see an area that will bring hurt and destruction to their camp, and, and we would be a per, people who would encourage one another when we see that area, where we see somebody who's, who's going to affect because we see the impact. Are you with me? Yes. And I want to be a place that, that, that charges and stirs hearts to be able to be a group of people that would love in such a ridiculous, ridiculously radical way, right? Because this church needs to be filled with broken people, Right? I mean, this is, this is uh, the place that people come and they can get restored in their identity in Christ and we can pour in the oil and the wine and we can let them know how much God values them, how much he cares about them, that we can do that with each other, that we come not to, to get into theological battles, but rest assured that the cross, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, the showering of his grace, his mercy, and love through and in us is what God desires to do. And he reshapes and he redeems our story, the brokenness of it, and he uses it to affect people, that each one of you has a story, you have experiences, you've been through some things. Quit hiding and, and being afraid of that. Start owning it and recognizing you screwed up in some areas of your life like I have, but when I surrendered it to God, God used it in a way that I couldn't imagine. And when he called us, my wife and I, to plant a church, I, I consulted with my mistakes in my past, and God said, that's what I want to use so that ultimately it will affect and change others. God will redeem. God can restore your addictions. God will use. And in the middle of those, we can be an encouragement to others. This is not just a place to, to come and to just be perfect. You are on a journey, are you not? I mean, I know, you know, I grew up in a church and we would have testimony services and I always felt like after I gave that testimony that everything had to just be, be spotless. You know what I mean? Like I got up and be like, you know, I've been dealing with this and now, you know, praise God, everything's good. And then when I walked down, you know, two weeks later, I was screwing up again. And I was like, I can't go back because I can't go back and talk about this because I got up and I told everybody I was free from this. I'm perfect now. And, you know, that, that's... That's ridiculous because there's ebb and flows and roller coasters of life. That's why a church should be for the spiritual journey, that we, we get to know one another and, and we, don't, we don't try to be perfect, but what we can do is we can talk about the perfect Father, the perfect love. We can rest in the cornerstone who is the righteousness, 
who is our righteousness, who makes us righteous and clean and free. And we spend our time there talking about how good God is. And we talk about, you know, what Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation, salvation, health, healing, everything you desire for life. I am like rambling on here. Anyway, is it good? Are you with me? <laughs> All right, so kind of come, bring it to a close. So a question that I want to ask, and we see in Joshua's life that he, he quits praying, and he gets up and he confronts everyone. He has all the tribes come forward, if you read the rest of the story. And then finally Achan comes forward, and Achan admits to where there's an error. Joshua has the items returned. Achan is punished. And then they return to Ai, and they take the city. So we see that this isn't a time to pray. God tells them, stand up. It's not a time to pray. There are, there are things in the Bible that you do not have to pray about. Loving people, you don't have to ask God about that. You can, just, you can just take that one and do that, all right? Are you with me? And some questions that I want to ask this morning is, A, are you hiding behind your prayers when you need to just stand up and do something, right? I mean, is there an area that you are, are, are desiring to see maybe some change in? But maybe you just need to stop praying and you just need to just go ahead and do it. I mean, there are areas that we don't have to pray, be, pray about, right? Things I just said, we don't have to pray about taxes. We should just go ahead and, and pay those things because the Bible's pretty clear on it. But what, are, what is something that you need to stop just praying about and you need to, to get some things in order? You know, if, if you're desiring, let me just say this. I'll, I'll use myself as an example. You know, I could... God, you know, just, just thank you that you just, just help me to be healthier. Father, just help me to just be, have stronger muscles. And Lord, that I would just, you know, just be fit, that I'd have, you know, just, you know, something that my wife would just, you know, she would just hold on a pedestal, Lord, you know, whatever it is. Just gonna... <laughs> How many of you know I'm going to be praying that for a long time? I got to get up and I got to go to the gym. I, I got I to get on my bike and do something. I got I to gotta create some movement. So, what areas are you hiding behind? Is it spiritually? Are you, are you wanting to see transformation in the city? Are, are you a person who, sometimes we could do this in Scottsdale, all oh, everybody, they're just all, you know, Snotsdale, they're all this and that and the other. Well, I mean, and, and are you a person who, who has been praying that this city would have a tremendous revival? But you spend every moment of your waking hours complaining about all the people in this city? How about you get off your blessed assurance and you go start loving somebody? How about you post up at the Starbucks and you get to know somebody? And it, hopefully we've, we've all had the conversation here about we, we are not here to notch things on our belt and to each one reach one with a notch on our belt. But how about we love people, hear their story, and reach out and start doing something to affect change within our little area. Okay, I'll move on. So also, are you trying to pray your way out of something that you have behaved your way into, right? Do you, do you need to, maybe where you've spent and saw all those shoes online and you've kept visiting those websites and shopped and shopped and shopped and now the credit card and you're praying for a financial miracle, how about you deal with the shopping monster in your, in your heart, okay? How about you sit down with somebody and if you see that, maybe some accountability. Okay, I'm talking for myself here. Amen. Don't hide. Don't hide behind your, you know, what we tend to do is hide behind our religious systems too, right? But let's, let's, let's really take to heart this and begin to, um, and to look at what can we do to take action. What's come to mind? Are there prayers that you pray secretly that may say, um, you know, there are areas where you're not taking responsibility and you're just praying them. Are there irresponsible people in your circle that, that we need to speak the truth in love to each other to help one another because you're just as irresponsible and, and really people who do the prayer thing are just, really what they are is just irresponsible prayers. Really, they're not, you know, they can have great words, but really they're just being irresponsible. But if we would reach out to each other and I, I wish I could tell you a story. 
in its fullest context, but I can't. But, I, but it will give you a little bit of uh, inclination to the type of pastor I am. But I will tell you, a few years back, we had a lady in our church, and her daughter, who had been going through a difficult time, she's not here now, so I can tell this story, but she, she basically had got approached by a person online. Really, it was a predator. And, and this predator essentially had been doing this to women all over the country, basically had been infiltrating and showing up in all kinds of places and um, basically stealing tens of thousands, getting them to sign up for credit cards and just charging up bills and then leaving town. Well, I got a call from the father who was from Ohio. And uh, the dad, I just, you're, you know, letting you know that. And the dad basically said, he you know, calls me and tells me this story and, uh, and says, listen, I'm going to be showing up and uh, I need you to help me. Can you get, get a few guys to help me? And I'm like, what exactly, what exactly do you want to do? <laughs> if you want to hear the rest of the story, you're going to have to talk to me in private. But I will say that that father, in his heart, to remove what was an issue in his daughter life, it was, it was pretty passion-filled. It was pretty serious. And even though his daughter didn't like because she had gotten emotionally attached, I, I watched what the love of a father will do even though his daughter is not super happy about it because she's caught up in the middle of it. Well, I want to be the type of people who love one another enough that will help each other past the areas where we need it so that we can encourage each other. And can we be a group of people this morning where God would whisper in our ear and say, stand up, stand up, I want you to take action, and I want you to do something, because this is where I've placed you. I want you to trust me. I want you to reach out, whether you're on the campus of ASU, whether you're at the local market, whether you're at Starbucks, whether, it doesn't matter. Because God has given us this city. We're responsible as people who follow Jesus to distribute blessing and love, mercy and compassion, grace and forgiveness. So keep your eyes peeled. Bow your head and close your eyes with me this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for each example that we see throughout your scriptures, Father, that lead us into the best possible light, life, that lead us into the design of what you've called us to do. Lord, this morning we surrender our hearts to you. We open up our hearts so that you could shine the spotlight in the areas where we do need to stand up and take responsibility. In every area, Father, in our spiritual lives, in our recreational lives, in our marriages, in our families, in this community. God, we can't just sit back and say we're an island under ourselves and just work our job and make our money and buy our car and buy our house. You put us here to wreak the love of God in this city. These neighborhoods and these apartments, these dorm rooms and these places that you've put us are not by happenstance. Father, ignite a responsibility, passion-filled, compassion guided missile in our hearts today, Lord, that we would look up and say, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Let me respond, Father. Let your love flow through me. Help me to reach out to the people surrounding me. Help me to see how to be a blessing. Help me to see how to be an encouragement. Help me to allow me the opportunity to reach out so that I could introduce them to your goodness and to your grace and your love. Father, we don't have to be religious. We don't have to be weird. All we have to do is be responsible to love people. God, we accept it today. Help us to step out behind our prayers and step out into this city, Father, so that we can reach it, that we can love it. Father, help us to open our eyes to places that we have been judgmental, things that we cringe at because we got immersed into a, a world system where, you know, ooh, sinners or ooh, sin. Father, that's not how you responded to people. We have our own mistakes. We have our own sin where we're missing the mark. God, help us to recognize that the things that we have labeled are actually people with names. Lisa and Joe and Amanda and whoever it is, God, help us to step beyond our judgments, reach out to see that there are people who have stories 
that you want us to minister to. Help us be salt. Help us be light. Help us to change the world in which you've placed us. In Jesus' name, and everyone said,